we have an absolutely fantastic program. There are three excellent candidates seeking the Democratic nomination for Secretary of State for the state of Oregon, and we are very fortunate to have all three of them here. The format today is each candidate will have up to 10 minutes to present their case. Now, bear with me. You feel free to use three, five, seven, up to 10. When all three have finished their presentations, I'll come up and we'll open it up to questions. I'll ask the first question on behalf of a longtime member who can't be here, and the questioners will line up here. Please remember, only forum members that are paid up in good standing or grab Eric and give him $50 before they come up here um, can ask questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we've decided to go with alphabetical order, and we have Dana right over here who will raise his hand. Dana, Dana will be keeping time and will let the questioners know, I'll remind you when we get here, that they have only 30 seconds to ask a question, and they need to identify who they're asking the question of. So that's a proposition, or anyway, preposition. But nonetheless, who they're asking the question of, and if they have follow-up questions, they need to go to the back and ask again. Ladies and gentlemen, without yakking any further, State Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian. Well, thank you, Rob, and thank you once again to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum for hosting this very important community forum for Washington County. You've done it for many, many years, and uh, even before my time in politics, found it to be just such a great uh, resource and community gathering. So thanks for doing it for this forum. You know, I learned early on the importance of putting progressive values into action. My immigrant grandfather was a carpenter. He and his sons built the church that I was baptized in and many of the neighborhoods of my hometown. Uh, I learned uh, the value of working hard to take care of a family. And that's one of the reasons, as your labor commissioner, I've put more than $22 million in the pockets of Oregonians who have been treated unfairly more than ever before. We've also trained thousands for living wage jobs, with women participating at twice the national average here in Oregon. And now, nearly 150,000 middle and high school students have got access to 21st century shop classes because of the coalition that I helped bring together. I want to tell you about just one of those programs that we just started out in Bend to illustrate for you what I mean by 21st century shop class. This Bend program is focused on clean energy technologies. And at the beginning of the class, the students learn advanced computer-aided design and each of them actually designs an electric vehicle. And then they move to the middle part of the class where they learn welding and sheet metal construction. And they actually build the frame and the body of the electric car that they just designed. And then in the last part of the class, these students study advanced physics. They learn propulsion systems and braking systems. They assemble an electric motor and install it into this car. And at the end of the year, every one of these students has got a functioning electric vehicle. That's the fit. Well, it's not really the end of the class, because then they take them all down to the track in Madras and they race them. That's the face of the 21st century shop class. And if we continue down this road, It'll be the beginnings of the best workforce development system that you'll find anywhere in America. The Oregon Council on Civil Rights that I created drew the roadmap to achieve equal pay for equal work in this state. It is a travesty that women still only earn about 79 cents on the dollar compared uh, to men, and that people of color earn even less than that. The Civil Rights Council and I presented uh, that plan to the state legislature in the last session. We now have paid sick days in the Oregon Paycheck Fairness Act. Uh, we are becoming a state that will ensure that people are paid equally for the work that they perform. And as a senator, I took on climate change by passing Oregon's Renewable Energy Act guaranteeing that we had at least 25% of our electricity generated by renewable sources by the year 2025. We've recently stepped up that 
uh, goal because we've done so well on the 2007 Act. Uh, this was one of the most significant pieces of climate legislation in a generation. Oregon has got to become part of the booming clean energy economy that we are seeing around the world. We have to take advantage of that in order to boost our own economy here, expand and create jobs, and we are now on the pathway to doing it. Now, as Secretary of State, I am going to continue putting our progressive values into action. Now the secretary sits on the state land board along with the governor and the treasurer. The land board oversees the Oregon coast, our navigable rivers, our state forests, and other lands. And, it's, and that board is charged with using uh, those waterways and lands for their best economic benefit in order to fund um, uh, uh, public education through, um, through the common schools. Uh, foundation. Uh, now what we need to do is look at innovative ways of using those spaces in order to do the best we can for those lands and for our public schools and that's where we're going to take the next step in fighting climate change and boosting a clean energy economy in Oregon. Central and Southern Oregon are one of the best places on the globe for the development of geothermal electricity. And we're going, to, we're going to use the state lands in those areas to promote geothermal technologies, environmentally safe solar fields in the east. We should be looking at wave technologies along the Three Mile Strip off the Oregon coast. We not only will become a global leader in the fight against climate change, but again, we will take the next step in joining many places in the world that are part of this booming clean energy economy and will spur our own economic development right here in Oregon. The Secretary of State is also the state's chief auditor. Historically, the Audits Division does a fine job of tracking tax dollars within the state agencies to make sure they're being used uh, as they're intended. You're going to see two additional things from me. One of them is that you're going to see more program audits, meaning we're not just going to look at uh, how the tax dollars are being used, but we are going to analyze whether the uh, agencies are really meeting the mission that they're supposed to meet in order to take care uh, of Oregonians. Is our public school system meeting its mission in developing well -rounded, a well-rounded curriculum that graduates uh, well-rounded human beings with a full complement of music and art and civics education and physical education and shop classes. The audits division is something that can get in at that. Is our health care system in Oregon really providing the kind of benefits that it should so that every Oregonian has access to health care for themselves and their family? The audits division can shine a light on that produce solutions in places where we're falling short. You're going to see a much more aggressive use of the audits division to make sure the state agencies are actually fulfilling their mission. And then in addition, so much money, millions that leaves the state agencies into the private sector to private corporations that are contracting with the state of Oregon. We're going to follow that money and make sure that when it leaves the state agencies that it's being used for its intended purpose that, 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 and that those companies, in addition to using the tax dollars as they should, are following our minimum wage, our equal pay, our public contracting laws. And I tell you this, if they're not, that's going to be the end of them contracting with the state of Oregon. Other businesses that are out there for competing for those contracts deserve to have a level playing field, and we as taxpayers deserve to know that our hard-earned tax dollars are being used just as they are intended to be used. When it comes to elections, Oregon is already ahead of the curve with vote by mail and with our new motor voter law. What you'll see for me is you'll see same-day registration. You'll see ballots, the voters pamphlet, and state forums in first language so immigrants have got uh, equal access to, to the ballot. And you're going to see those kinds of documents on an app for a smartphone, too. So all of it is more accessible to people. You're going to see an effort at public financing for campaigns so that everybody's got an equal shot 
at running for office. And you're going to see a serious effort at campaign finance reform to get the big money out of politics. And I'll leave you with this. All of that starts with first restoring civics education to our public schools. And next, with the program I'm calling the Oregon Youth Vote, where we will get ballots to all of the schools, one for each student. Students will study uh, the ballot measures and the candidates, and we'll have our young people vote in every election. Bringing young people up with an understanding of the value in the process of voting. Now, it won't count in the official results, but you know what? When the election is over, we'll tally up those votes and we'll show Oregon what young people thought of the issues and the candidates at hand. Again, Washington County Public Affairs Forum, thank you very much for having us. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Devlin. I want to also thank very much the Washington County Public Affairs Forum uh, for this opportunity. Uh, this, this election is not like a sprint, it's like a marathon. And marathons are on my mind this morning because my campaign manager just finished in the last hour the Boston Marathon. Wow. <laughs> so I'm very proud of her. Uh, I grew up in this state and I grew up in a level of poverty that uh, unfortunately, too many people still experience. Uh, but my mother instilled in me two values. One is that education would be my path from poverty. And two, that wherever I go, whatever I do, I have a responsibility to give back to the community. In my early years, I never was actually in any location very long, being in the Marine Corps and later in graduate school. But when I returned to Oregon and at the old age of 30 years old, I started volunteering for my city government. Uh, I actually volunteered on the Parks Committee and was very instrumental there in actually uh, seeing that new parks were constructed in the city. Uh, a few years later, when I was 32, I was elected to the Twalton City Council. And then only four years later, was elected to the Metro Council and re-elected to the Metro Council. In 1996, I was elected to the Oregon House of Representatives, and some Democrats who go back that far remember who I defeated in 1996, Bob Tiernan, one of the uh, worst members of the legislature that anyone could possibly imagine. I've served as an elected official for 30 out of the last 32 years, and in that time, I've learned a great deal. But I've never been one to actually go out and issue press releases every two minutes about what I've done. But I'm very proud of what I've done. I'll give you an example in recent years. Uh, over the last two bienniums, we increased K-12 funding by $1.7 billion. I'm the chief budget writer for the Senate and play a key role in that. We also had record increases in this biennium in funding for community colleges and higher ed. And in addition to that, we fully funded the institution of full-day kindergarten, something that was decades overdue. In terms of my environmental record, you know, nobody remembers what you've done actually except for the last couple of years. Uh, but Metro now has about 17,000 acres in parks and green spaces. And I was the chair of both the policy and technical committee that put, to bet to, to put together the Metropolitan Green Spaces program that has led to all those accurate acquisitions. I've also actually was a co-sponsor on the commissioner's legislation on the RPS standard in 2007 and supported clean fuels. And after the commissioner left, uh, uh, Representative Hoyle and I removed the sunset on the clean fuels program so it's still in existence. And in this last session, we moved the RPS standard uh, to a much higher level. I've also been in a position that most people don't know too much about, and I have problems getting members that want to serve, because they all want to serve on policy committees so that they can actually create new and wonderful things, and they forget that uh, where, the ground, where the rubber really hits the road is actually in budget. So I've been the Natural Resources uh, Subcommittee Chairman for a couple of different bienniums, including the last one, which is very rare. And that's largely because of my I think well-deserved uh, 
credibility for working with all sides in the natural resources community. Uh, I have a long record in terms of supporting uh, working class families, a long record in terms of supporting collective bargaining. Uh, recently we passed retirement security, which is going to add to the security of a lot of Oregonians. I have a 100% record in women's reproductive rights, and uh, all three of us enjoy the endorsement of Planned Parenthood of Oregon. Uh, I have a 100% record for Basic Rights Oregon, and very much almost can recall the moment that former Chuck, Representative Chuck Carpenter in 1997 got up on the House floor and pulled a bill to the floor, or tried to pull a bill to the floor, uh, to provide for um, a non-discrimination in employment. That bill passed the House overwhelmingly, but in a 10 to 20 Senate, uh, 10 Ds, 20 Rs, never saw the light of day. And I've been supportive all the time since then. My values as a Democrat, I think, are as good as anybody that's running. But more important than my values in some ways, although those are, should be at the core of your decision, is I provide sort of a unique background to this position. In my 20 years in the legislature, in the House, I served as the vice chair of the Rules and Elections Committee. In the Senate, when I was the Senate Majority Leader, I served as the chair of the Rules and Elections Committee. When I wasn't on Rules and Elections, I was on Ways and Means, and have been the chief budget writer in Ways and Means for the last six years, and have co-chaired two different audits committee. The Secretary of State has a number of different responsibilities, but the two that are most important, more important than any of the others, in fact, if you don't do these too well, you're not really doing your job, is they are the chief elections officer of the state and the chief auditor of public accounts. In that eight years on rules and elections, I worked towards the implementation of vote by mail, a centralized voter registration system, online voter registration, significant initiative reform that got fraud out of our initiative system, motor voter, both the old motor voter and the new motor voter, and recently, Representative Hoyle and I actually co-sponsored SB 1586, which actually gives our students in community colleges and universities much more access to, in order to register new voters on their campuses. I believe very strongly in expanding access to the ballot. I believe we need to get rid of our 20-day limit on registration, cut off. I believe we also need to actually start using business remittance envelopes so that those that uh, have trouble getting a stamp can actually turn in their ballot, and that's more people than you actually think, even though I think people sometimes make fun of that. I'm also very much in favor of ensuring that our ballots are in the first language of the person, both our information in terms of our voters' pamphlets and our ballots. And I also am the only candidate here with a strong record over multiple sessions on campaign finance reforms. In audits, I've been on Ways and Means for 11 years and I've been the chief Senate budget writer for six years. I believe I have the broadest and most in-depth understanding of state government of any of the Secretary of State candidates, Democratic, Republican, Independent, or anyone else who enters. In fact, I think I'm more prepared to assume the role of the chief auditor of public accounts than any previous Secretary of State. And I believe I can actually bring that to a whole new level in terms of efficiency, in terms of effectiveness, in terms of accountability, and in terms of transparency. I think there are many areas where we're doing a good job in state government, but there are many areas where we're not doing too good of a job. And I think one of the things we need to do in terms of performance audits is not only look at the performance of our entities out there, whatever entities they are, but look at best practices around the United States, because there are 49 states other than us, and many of those states seem to be producing better results. Finally, when it comes to having the specific skills, and I think those are important, the specific experiences and the record applicable to being Oregon's next Secretary of State, I believe no other candidate can better fulfill those responsibilities than I can, and I would be honored to have your support. Thank you, Senator. Ladies and gentlemen, Val Hoyle. Hi, I 
want to thank everybody for having us here today. I appreciate it. I, um, my name is Val Hoyle. I'm a state representative. I represent House District 14 in Lane County. So that's West Eugene and Junction City, uh, sort of a rural blue collar district. Um, and I, I am the former majority leader of the House. I stepped down from being majority leader to run for Secretary of State. I felt like if I was going to run for office, if I was going to raise money and talk to people about the office, that I needed to do that specifically for myself and not use the influence of my position for my own personal gain. But I was caucus leader for four years and really, really enjoyed it. And during that time, with the help of Washington County and many, many people here, um, we were able to not only build our majority, but increase our majority at a time when across the country Democrats lost. And because of that, we passed some of the most progressive legislation in the nation. And again, I, I want to be very clear, we would not have done that without the help of people that were here. So um, I grew up in a family where I knew my voice mattered in the political process. Um, my father was president of the Firefighters Union. He was a, a pro-life Democrat labor organizer. My mother was a pro-choice Republican that worked for reproductive health um, with the National Organization of Women before Roe versus Wade. So um, in my family, people had a very diverse set of opinions, but we knew our voice mattered. I worked on my first presidential campaign at nine. Uh, no, my first uh, campaign at nine, first presidential campaign at 11, I was working for Mo Udall. Uh, my dad was working for Tom Harkin, the labor candidate. My mom was working for Ford. We were in New Hampshire, so presidential primaries are wide open there. And uh, Carter won that election. It was 76. So, you know, on my 18th birthday, um, I went to school and my girlfriend said, it's eight, you're 18, do you know what that means? And I said, yes, I can vote in the next election. And she said, I was going to say you could go to Rhode Island and buy beer legally, but I guess you could vote. Because I wasn't like other girls. I knew my voice mattered. So when I went to college, I got involved in student government. I worked with MassPerg. Um, I then uh, worked with... Um, Went to, uh, I worked um, on the last immigration reform bill in, in the 80s. And um, I knew that if I worked hard, that my voice would count. A lot of us together can make sure that we can make a difference. When we moved to Oregon in 1999, we moved here on the basis of the reputation of the school district and the quality of life. I had three different job offers. One in Pennsylvania, one in Colorado, and one here. I took the lowest paying job because of the quality of the education system. And then got here and found out about Measure 5 and found out about the cuts. And people would say to me, gosh, you should have been here 10 years ago before Measure 5. We had all these programs. We had all these things. But I had two children in schools. So I joined the PTO. I became president. I started working for candidates. I started working on ballot measures and bond measures. I became chair of the Democratic Party of Lane County and started recruiting candidates to win in swing districts like mine candidates that looked like the districts they were running in. And we in Lane County helped pick up two of the four seats that got us the majority in 2006. And then changes were able to be made. Um, I, I, in 2009, I was appointed to, to, um, to represent House District 14. And I won. I was the only new uh, candidate in a swing district to win in 2010. It was a brutal year. Um, and when I got to the legislature, after one session, I ran for and was honored to be elected as House Majority Leader by my colleagues. And we passed a lot of great legislation. So things like clean fuels, background checks for private gun sales, and tuition equity. Um, but what I'm most proud of is that we passed new motor voters. So we added over 300,000 people, 300,000 eligible voters to be automatically registered. At times when across the country, in Wisconsin, they just knocked 300,000 eligible voters off the voter rolls. What we saw in Ohio, what we saw in Florida, what we're seeing in South and North Carolina. The fact is that there are a group of people that want to disenfranchise voters. And I'm running for Secretary of State because I grew up in a family where I knew my voice mattered. We didn't have money. 
I'm a second generation American, married to an immigrant, and the fact of the matter is, I feel like I have the privilege to vote and that every single person should have that privilege. So now that we've registered these people, I would like to run for Secretary of State so that we can encourage people to participate in the process, to let them know their voice matters. Whether they live in a rural district or they live in an urban district, um, I sponsored the bill to allow um, voter information to be printed in other languages. Um, also, in co-sponsoring the, the bill to have appropriate campaign finance limits with Senator Devlin, the fact is that we have ordinary people shut out of the process because of big money in politics, and we need to stop that. We need to make sure that if people are, are contributing to an election, that you know who someone's largest donors are. That's vitally important. Um, in terms of the audits division, I believe that we need to use our state's dollars effectively, efficiently to protect critical services and also make sure that if there are programs that are working well, that we do audits to find out what they're doing and how we can invest in that and spread that throughout the state. Um, I do have background doing audits. I was the former international warranty manager at Trek Bicycles. I managed finding and solving problems across four continents, multiple languages, many cultures, all at one time, so hundreds of people, and I would like to take that skill set and bring it to, the, to state government. In the corporations division, I think that we can do better in um, international relations and, in, and in, in increasing international trade. Those are great opportunities and great jobs for Oregonians. In the 2009 uh, recession, international trade was the single um, point of economic growth. Um, on the land board, um, having, be, having represented a district from outside the Portland metro area, I think it is very important that we are good stewards to the land that we are given, that we manage that land well, and that for the protection, not only the benefit of the common school fund, but looking at the whole benefit, whether that's um, carbon pricing or you know using our navigable waterways in appropriate ways, we can do more with our state lands, and I would love to be a voice there. And then with elections, making sure that elections are free, fair, accessible for all people, not just the people that can afford it. Um, again, addressing campaign finance reform. And most importantly um, for me, I want to be a voice on the Board of Education. The Secretary of State is a non-voting member of the Board of Education. I came here because of the reputation of the schools. I know as a first generation college, the first person in my family to go to college, that education is opportunity. We need to do better. And as someone that learns differently, I want to be a voice to make sure that if we're testing our students, it's to give information to teachers as to what the students know and how students learn, as opposed to having tests where teachers have to teach to the test and our children are not benefiting from that process. So um, I'm running to be your Secretary of State. I have, I have an extensive background in the public and private sector. Um, I've had the honor of representing Oregonians for the past six and a half years, and I would love to serve as your Secretary of State, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. As questioners will line up to my right, there's a longtime forum member, Harry Bodine, who is unfortunately unable to be here, and he sent a question that he would ask, would like to ask if he could be here. It's my pleasure on his behalf to address this question. As a quick reminder, questioners, including me in a half a second, will have up to 30 seconds to ask their question. And this might sound familiar. Please make sure it's in the form of a question. And respondents will have up to two minutes to respond. And again, Dana will be keeping time. And when someone asks a question, please identify if it's for all, then all will have a chance to answer. If it's for one, then that person will answer, and that's it. The other folks will not have a chance unless it comes around again in another question. So with the pleasure of starting off questions from Harry, uh, I'm quoting, 20 years ago, this is for all, 20 years ago, every legislative district in Washington County was competitive. Today, thanks to partisan gerrymandering following the last three censuses, maybe one or two of them are. The lines have been drawn so that today one party has controls all but one party controls all but one Washington County legislative district statewide. Maybe five or 10 of the 75 Oregon House and Senate races in 2016 are truly competitive. 
Would you have any interest in setting up a redistrict, redistricting system like the ones Canadians implemented 50 years ago and California initiated in 2011, where the lines are drawn by nonpartisan commissions who have no direct interest in furthering their individual political careers? I hope I did that under 30 seconds. <laughs> Folks? Well, Harry, I don't know what the reason is for you not being here, but you're always a welcome person at these gatherings, and I, I hope all is well with you, and thank you, Harry, for, for the question. Uh, you know, in any system you're going to implement, especially one the one you just described where you have nonpartisan people that are appointed, somebody is the appointing source of that. Maybe it's a governor that just got done running in a partisan election. Maybe it's the Secretary of State. Uh, which, uh, which is the same, and, and so if you're talking about getting a political influence out of the system, I'm not convinced that that is the way to do it. The way to do it is to follow the law. And Oregon has a terrific system of, of, of uh, resetting its districts every time there's a census. You keep like communities together, and if you do that, you're going to have a fair system for everybody. Now, I was around those 20 years ago, uh, in politics locally in Washington County here uh, when uh, there was nary a Democrat to be found any, in virtually any legislative district and it did change. I don't think it changed because of an inappropriate use of the redistricting. This is why it changed. When I was running for the House and others were over a decade ago, we registered thousands of voters. We organized, we went door to door, we held town halls, we went to community meetings, we got people involved in the process and a lot of people registered as Democrats. That is just the fact of it and the statistics show it. And in addition, the community has changed. As the west side of Portland has grown out further into Washington County, our demographics have simply changed. And that has been the difference in uh, the number of Democrats that are registered and turn out and vote in Washington County. And because of that, the number of Democrats that are elected from this area. I would concur with many of the statements that Commissioner Avakian made, but I'd like to add a little bit more to that. Uh, I have a pretty long background in redistricting, uh, a redistricting that no one would care about probably here. Uh, you actually know that your county here is actually redistricted every 10 years also in terms of the, uh, in terms of the commissioners. But I was one of the parties given the task of doing the redistricting for the Metro Council back in 1991, the first time they ever actually had the opportunity to do that. So I went through all the training. They wanted to make sure we did it right, and I think we did it right. But 10 years later in, in the Oregon House, I was actually on the internal redistricting committee uh, for, the, for the House Democrats. And I will tell you that actually things have changed. Demographics have changed. People have changed. I have a great deal of respect for Mr. Bodine. He was actually one of the first parties that ever interviewed me for public office when he was on uh, staff with the Oregonian and for many years after that interviewed me. But the reality is, is that uh, about 1984 when I was elected to the Tualatin City Council, I believe Democrats were represented in Washington County by one legislator who had four precincts. Four precincts. And things changed dramatically. And now if you look on a statewide basis, Washington County is almost as consistent as Multnomah County in supporting whoever the Democratic statewide person is that's running. So I do think there are things that can be done to improve the system. One of the things is more public input. The other is trying to make the public care more about how it's done. The other thing is you can't necessarily avoid, you can't always just not put like interests together. But you, what, what you have to do is you'd have to try to avoid dividing interests. So particularly in a congressional district, you are going to have different interests within a congressional district, different communities. So, but I do think there are things that can be done to make the process better. But I think it's actually can be more improved. And I don't think actually some of the things that have been suggested actually would have any better results than what we have.
Um, I, I have a similar view to my colleagues, and I think if you uh, want to see what our, uh, you know, what our suggestions are, um, commoncause.org actually has a questionnaire that we filled out to talk about um, what, what we support in terms of um, uh, redistricting. I personally do not believe that a nonpartisan redistricting commission is actually nonpartisan. It gives the appearance of nonpartisanship, when, but it's actually appointed by the people in power, and we have seen this throughout the country. Uh, Canada has an interesting election system in, in that when they call for an election, they have a limited time where candidates go out and campaign. I would love that. It's like two months or something. It would be fantastic. Um, but we have a very different system. Um, we, in, in 2011, had a bipartisan redistricting commission. We had an equal number of Democrats and Republicans. And I think that that was a good system. Um, Iowa has an interesting redistricting system. It kind of works. California, I have to say, between the top two primary that they have and their independent redistricting, they have more money in politics. Um, I mean, it really has increased the amount of money in politics. So I just don't see looking at California as a model as a good idea. So I would um, support bipartisan or tripartisan redistricting commission um, and uh, I also, um, I come from a swing district. My district was Republican from 1978 when Ted Kulingowski left to 2006. It's the former seat of uh, Republican Speaker uh, Larry Campbell. And the reason that they vote for Democrats is that um, my party and me as a candidate, they feel that I represent their values better than the Republicans that have run. And I think that we've seen changing demographics, and that's the reason more Democrats have been elected in Washington County. Thank you. Next question. Um, Jim K. Four, member. Um, Harry Bodine's question on redistricting was not based on partisanship, but on population. Based on per capita demographics, Washington County is owed one and a half more state rep districts and one extra <coughs> state senate district in Washington County. But my question is about hair dye. There's been scientific studies that hair dye affect the brain. Can all three candidates discuss their use of hair dye? Thank you. Well, when I was younger, I used to bleach my hair and dye it gray so uh, I would look older. Uh, I haven't had to do that in the last 30 years. <laughs> As the only woman in the race, there's been a number of stories and coverage where it's frustrating in that my opponents are covered by the level of their experience and their accomplishments, and I am very experienced. I have 25 years in the private sector. I was the chairperson of the Federal Advisory Board on International Trade for Small Business, and I'm covered as the person. So they're covered by their experience and accomplishments, and we're all experienced and accomplished. I'm covered by where I live, the fact that I tell funny jokes, and that I look pretty. I will tell you, I am a competent candidate, and whether or not I use hair dye, how I look, what makeup I have, that is not as important as what I bring to this table. And what I bring to this table and what I bring to this race is that I am the most qualified, I have the, the most diverse experience, and, and I quite frankly find your question offensive. Next question, which will be perhaps more colorful than the gray one we just had. Um, hi, I'm Sora Dubitsky, and my question has to do with uh, the fact that the Secretary of State is next in line for the governorship in this state. What do each of you, or how do each of you feel that you are qualified to be governor should anything happen to Kate Brown? Oh, and I was, I was brown, then gray, then brown again. I mean, all three, all three. What qualifies you to be governor? So I'd like to be perfectly clear. I am running for the office of Secretary of State. There have only ever been four Secretaries of State that have become governor, and last recently we, we've seen it, we saw it through tragic circumstances. Um, and I think if you do your job well, and you are fair, and you're impartial in covering elections and redistricting, you probably do a lot to ruin your chances to go up to governor because nobody will be happy. But having said that, 
Um, again, I have 25 years private sector business experience. I've managed hundreds of people across continents, languages, cultures. I was a successful majority leader after one term. Um, we were able to pass the agenda that, um, that the House Democrats ran on, work together as a team, and maintain strong working relationships with the Republicans that were in the House. The fact is, um, I, I know how to lead. I call my leadership style the soccer mom school of management. It's like, you know, trying to get, <laughs> whether it's 35 Democrats or, you know, I don't know, a birthday party for 19 five-year-olds, you know, you have to make everybody get out happy with matching gift bags or the things that they want. The fact is that I'm able to manage people and outcomes. I'm transparent, I'm open, and I'm a, I have a collaborative leadership style. Much like Kate Brown, um, and so I would lead in, in, in the style that she has, or uh, former Governor Barbara Roberts. I think they brought the same type of um, leadership style to the table. So I would not wish that. That's not what I'm running for. But should it happen, I would absolutely be prepared to, to do that. Well, I can't tell you how excited I am to serve as your Secretary of State. There are some tremendous things that we're going to do with that post together. If the unthinkable were to happen and something were to happen to the governor or she vacated the job for whatever reason. Um, experience is critical here. And my opponents are trying very hard to convince you that they are the most experienced candidate in this race. But when you assume the role of governor, you need not only to have the legislative experience, but the experience of managing state agencies. These are two different branches of government. There is only one person in this race that has the experience both of representing Washington County as a state legislator in the House and the Senate, and then for the last eight years in the executive branch successfully managing a state agency, which, by the way, is about the same size and composition as the Secretary of State's office. Uh, I hope to have a long tenure of eight years as your Secretary of State but if that unthinkable thing were to happen, I am prepared immediately uh, to assume that role and represent you well there. I want to make it very clear that I'm running to be your next Secretary of State. Let me repeat that, running to be your next Secretary of State. Governor Roberts told me that, obviously, given the tragic circumstances that have occurred, uh, more people are aware of the succession process in Oregon than they ever have been. Probably three or four years from now, not as many people will be aware. And usually it's been through tragic circumstances. Sometimes it's been through taking other office. But the reality is, is that we went through a very tragic time for this state uh, with Governor Kitzhaber. And Governor Brown has done a remarkable job, given the fact that new governors normally have at least a couple of months to prepare, and she had five days. I worked both in the public and private sectors, but I really believe the experience that actually gives me the heads up uh, is my experience in ways and means. I, I have been on ways and means for 11 years. I've been the chief budget writer for the Senate for six. I meet with agency heads literally every month, practically, on some issue. Uh, I'm so aware of every function that state government has that I think I'm often consulted by governors about what some of the problems are. Uh, we have small agencies. Uh, actually, Bowie is a little bit over 100 employees. Uh, the Secretary of State is a little bit over 200 employees. They're both very small entities with very important responsibilities, actually. Uh, Department of Human Services and the Oregon Health Authority have close to 10,000 employees. You know, in, in higher ed, uh, even though they are in somewhat a little bit different now, not as a state agency, but a state entity, there are close to 15,000 employees there. I think if the tragic thing happened, I think I would be more prepared than any of the other candidates that are running Democrat or Republican to assume those responsibility. But it would be a reluctant responsibility, but one that I think that I could do and do well. But I'm running for Secretary of State. Thank you, folks. Next questioner, Bill. 
<clears throat> I'm, excuse me, I'm Bill Kroger, a forum member. Um, the language, the language, business language of our country is English. And uh, uh, when you have a common language like that, people tend to understand each other, they pull together, they help each other out, just because everybody understands what's going on with each other. I'm just trying to understand the logic of having a whole bunch of pamphlets and literature and stuff in multiple languages instead of encouraging people to learn English and making it easy for them to do so. I don't think I don't think that one necessarily precludes the other. You know, we're a country uh, that was founded on uh, being the refuge of the world and also being the place of great opportunity for the world. And uh, I don't know what it is in politics today at the national level that has us trying to build walls instead of tear them down to decrease the chance for opportunity rather than to provide it. And when immigrants come to this country, I welcome them. And the day will come when certainly uh, they're better English speakers than they are in their first language, but there is always a period of time when that isn't the case. And during that period of time, I want them to have as much access to our resources, to our ballot, as absolutely possible. And that's the reason for providing the ballot the voters pamphlet and other state forms in first languages as well as in English. So I think I mentioned before, I'm a second generation American. I've had the great, great opportunity to live and travel and work in countries all over the world. Um, my, my husband grew up predominantly in, in Southern Africa and Zambia and South Africa. And in South Africa, there are 27 official languages. In Europe, you go, you go places, people speak four and five languages. And I think, uh, actually, um, my, my deputy campaign manager, Jennifer, and I were talking um, on the way here about the difference of seeing Amer America, the United States, as a melting pot as opposed to a mosaic. As I've become an American, as, as my husband became an American citizen, which he proudly became uh, just a number of years ago. To be fair, he had a green card before he met me. I want, I want to put that on the record. <laughs> Married for love. Um, and, uh, but he, he became a citizen three years ago, two, two, three years ago, and he was very proud to do so. Um, the fact of the matter is, we are stronger for what we bring to the table. We are stronger when we embrace our cultures and we embrace our country. We are a country built on immigrants and immigration, and I think we are better when we see our country as a mosaic. So if reaching out to people and getting people to vote means it's easier for them to read in their native language, that doesn't mean that people don't speak English, but it's one more way to engage people and understanding why people aren't voting. My father works with immigrant communities um, in the Northeast. The Cambodian population, they don't vote because when they got involved with the government, when they were home, when they were back in Cambodia, people got murdered. So you have to think other people come here and they're used to a government that is not, that's not transparent and that, that, that is corrupt. That's not what we have here. I want every single person voting. I want them to know what they're voting on. I want to see how to engage them in the process. And we are a country that is stronger with immigrants because we're built on immigration. Thank you. You can tell by my name, Richard Devlin, that I am of Irish heritage. Uh, my relatives came here many generations ago, and obviously they didn't have perhaps a difficulty with the language, although their accent was probably not well received. They had a lot of other issues in terms of discrimination. But most people don't know is that my spouse is actually an immigrant. And because I served in the Marine Corps, when I mention where she's from, they always assume that I met her in the Marine Corps. I did not. I met her at Pacific Lutheran University. Uh, uh, she is from Hong Kong. Uh, she's actually spoken English since she was five, five years old. Uh, we will soon celebrate our 44th wedding anniversary. So, but when I think about this, I think about the people I have worked with. My wife actually worked for about eight years with immigrants from Southeast Asia, uh, many, many years ago, actually. You'll now find them as your physicians, 
Uh, you will find them actually out uh, doing every job imaginable, teachers, etc. But one of the things we know about when people acquire a language, and we have this debate constantly in education, because people start to want to limit English language learners' programs in, in, uh, in our public schools. A lot of people believe you can learn English in one or two years. But to actually learn it, to academically learn it, so that you can function, actually takes from five to seven years. And the reality is, is we have many people that are making that transition to English language that deserve to participate in our process who would be actually in much better position if they could get a voter's pamphlet in their native language and if they could get a ballot in their native language. We do that for practically everything else in government, and I think it's long past time we started doing it in our electoral process. Thank you, folks. And please, as a reminder, please identify to whom you're ask, addressing the questions. Next questioner. Hi, Virginia Bruce, forum member. This question's for everybody. Brad brought up the topic of uh, using contractors to do government work. And it occurs to me that every time you hire a contractor, our tax dollars are going for profit of that contractor in addition to accomplishing whatever job they're hired for. If you're elected as Secretary of State, would you be interested in working to lessen the dependence of government on contractors, bringing more of those jobs back to the government? I think I would approach it, Virginia, this way. We always want our tax dollars to be being used as efficiently and as wisely as possible. And there are appropriate times when a partnership with the private sector can really benefit everybody by bringing in a particular level of expertise or a specialized field that you don't see within local or state government. What we want to do, and as the state's chief auditor would have a duty to do, would be to make sure first that those tax dollars are being used for their intended purposes when they go to a private contractor. Uh, and the second, that the mission, the, the, uh, the, uh, the agency's mission in providing a public service for people is actually being accomplished through the use of that private contractor. And if those things are true, then you probably have a very smart use of your money. If not, the audit should highlight that and provide an alternative that does serve uh, the public's mission in a better way. I think there are appropriate times to internally uh, fund functions in terms of employees and appropriate times to contract. Let me give you a specific example. We have a fairly large Department of Transportation, uh, which is responsible for planning, to some degree engineering, and to a large degree maintenance of our facilities, but not all maintenance. Uh, we contract for every major transportation project we have, and that's appropriate. Because if you look at how we spend transportation dollars, we go through a cycle like this. And what we would have to do to actually have employees to do all those functions to build bridges, reconstruct roads, uh, would be enormous. And it would also not be as cost as effective. So I think there clearly are times when functions are more appropriately uh, uh, done internally and times when they're contracted out. Very few people know that uh, we don't have like a dozen contracts at the state level. We have thousands of contracts at the state level. All the thing from the smallest of items to, to major contracts uh, that involve hundreds of millions of dollars. And sometimes I think those function well, sometimes they don't. But what you do need is the people to oversee those contracts. And the audits division is one of those functions, but actually the function also has to be within the agencies, and we've tried to make sure that that occurs. Uh, but actually there's an appropriate time for like I say, there's an appropriate time to contract out for service, and there's times when it isn't, uh, isn't appropriate. I've not been one that's very much in favor of privatization of public services, because every example I've ever seen has actually led to uh, uh, more part-time workers, uh, less benefits for workers, more people paying barely minimum wage. So uh, I'll leave it at that. To 
So uh, similar to my colleagues, I, um, I think that fundamentally I believe that there is a, a, a role for government. It is important and it's different than the role of the private sector and needs to be run differently. In the private sector, you're looking at a bottom line. Good companies look at the triple bottom line, the social impact, the environmental impact, and then the financial impact. In government, we're tasked at taking care of those who are most vulnerable. And I think I can think of two examples where contracting out of critical services has resulted in disaster, both in Lane County and Multnomah County. Um, they contracted out uh, medical and nursing services um, to uh, private organization from out of state as opposed to having nurses on site. So these private organizations, again, have a bottom line that they have to meet. And um, in, in one example, the Oregonian just wrote about, editorialized about it, a young woman died after being um, in heroin withdrawal for six or seven days, and she was clearly dehydrated. She wasn't allowed to see her parents. She asked for help over and over again, and they did not. They did not help her. They did not give her appropriate medical services, and she died. The same thing happened to us in Lane County. After we had, uh, we had nurses that were represented by AFSCME that were employed by uh, the county jail. Um, they let go of those nurses, brought in a private company. Um, we, had, we had, you know, we have people that are in our prisons that are in jails that are mentally ill, that have severe issues. They shouldn't be, you shouldn't be jailed because you're mentally ill, but this is what happens. We had one man die and, um, uh, and some other pretty tragic circumstances. So there's a role for government, the role of private sector, the role for the private sector, and I think we need to balance that. Thank you. Uh, next question, or Xander, please. Hello, my name is Xander, former member. Um, as a person who makes slightly over $15 minimum wage, the new minimum wage bill that's coming up and the increase in the minimum wage, what are your thoughts about how it's going to affect people who just are just slightly above that now? So for me, someone who just has got out of high school is going to make the same money as I do, but I've gone to school for three or four years trying to you know, better myself, and now, now I can't get ahead anymore because now the minimum wage has increased. So what are your positions on the minimum wage and how it's going to affect those that in my category and how you, would you do to change that? Uh, anyone who wants to answer? So anyone you want. So I, I supported and voted for an increase in the minimum wage, uh, was glad to do so. I have a lot of people in my district who uh, work minimum wage and barely get by. They work a number of part-time jobs. I have 31 uh, mobile home parks in my district, so again, I don't represent a wealthy district. But what I know is in the metro area, the cost of living is incredibly high. And people that are working full-time should not be living in poverty. They should be able to afford housing. They should be able to afford basic services. Um, what I think we need to do is, is um, two things. One is I supported the minimum wage. I, I would take that vote again. Um, we listen to businesses and we, we have a phased in approach so that you know, uh, the raise in wage can be, um, you know, the economy and, and businesses can handle that raise in wage. The other thing we need to do is attract more businesses to Oregon that pay above minimum wage. People in my district, they want to work. They don't want to work for minimum wage. They want to have the kind of jobs that they used to have. We lost over 5,000 manufacturing jobs in and around my district all of which paid more than minimum wage. So the way that we attract companies that pay more than minimum wage to Oregon is by investing in an education system. Um, that's what brings people here. That's what brings businesses here. And so I would work on both of those things. Again, attracting more companies so that somebody who works hard, that shows up, um, can make a good wage, a good living wage, have a home, go on vacation, and make a better life for their children. And I think that's where we should be focusing. It's important to consider who the minimum wage worker is the, these days. It isn't anymore some high school student that's working a few hours after school to earn a little bit of pocket change. About 62% of minimum wage workers are women over the age of 30, and many of them have got children at home. Nobody who's working full time and taking care of a family should be living in poverty. Therefore, the increase to the minimum wage was necessary not just 
for workers, but to increase the consumer purchasing power that people have in Oregon to support local businesses. What we need to turn our attention to now is developing those middle class jobs that we used to have, especially in manufacturing, that we have lost because of misguided federal policies that are sending our jobs overseas. And Washington County has seen the loss of those jobs as much or more than anybody in the state of Oregon. So yes to the increase in the minimum wage, even more so. Yes now to a robust effort to bring back, back middle class jobs that will take care of our families and our workers. Like the other speakers here today, I supported the increase in the minimum wage, and I'm very appreciative of the work that uh, Senator Dembro did on this, this particular issue. And I believe in the House it was Representative Jessica Vega Peterson who, who led the effort. It is a minimum wage that actually has three different levels depending upon where you are in the state in terms of where you live, and that was pretty, had a pretty solid basis in terms of the cost of living in those areas. It's a gradual increase to the, the, the minimum wage that's in the bill. And I think to address the gentleman's issue specifically, we knew that there would be people now that make more than the minimum wage, and we knew that people would be coming in at higher wages. And I actually do honestly believe, since this is gradual, what will happen is employers to retain the people that they want to retain will have to increase those wages. Now, I know that will be a cost on employers, but I think it will generally be in benefit of, of the public as a whole. And I agree with uh, all, of, all of my parties here that one of the things we need to do is to find more jobs that are more middle income jobs in this state. One of those areas that often overlooked is we're a fairly strong state in terms of manufacturing. We don't think of ourselves that way. But many of those jobs can pay more and do pay more. And there's more we can do, do to encourage more business within this state. But I think the minimum wage increases were overdue. I think it was a significant discussion over a prolonged period of time, not something that was simply decided in a short session. And I think parties came to a reasonable compromise, and I was happy to support that compromise. Ladies and gentlemen, we've run out of time. If the candidates have a few more moments after we close, and there's some folks already lined up for questions, I hope they will be able to give the, their time to us. Please join me in thanking three marvelous individuals. <laughs> the bad news is only one can win. The good news is we're a very fortunate state getting wonderful service from three talented, skilled individuals. And once again, I thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, same time next week, we have invited all five candidates seeking the Republican nomination for governor. Three have confirmed with two. We're just not sure, but it should be pretty darned exciting. Next week, same time, same station. Thank you.